The next question is a video. It's from Zoe Tulip in Canberra. Hi, my name's Zoe and I'm an undergraduate student studying visual arts and science communication at the Australian National University. So I saw the performance by Chris Hadfield up on the ISS and, you know, it was really cool combining science with art and music and it was great. It's always great seeing those two things come together. But I was kind of curious to ask Chris, was there also an underlying message of science in that performance or was it just about showing the possibilities of, yeah, combining art with science? Okay, Chris, before we go to you on that, let's take a quick look at what Zoe's talking about, Chris Hadfield's YouTube clip <laughs> seen by hundreds of millions of people, at least a section of it. Ground control to Major Tom. Commencing countdown engines on. Detach from station and may God's love be with you. A couple of little sections from the video there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just before we go to Zoe's question, is it true that your son pretty much twisted your arm to do that? Yeah, that, that was just a father-son project. He sent me a note saying, hey, Dad, you really ought to record Oddity while you're up there. I was going, Oddity? The astronaut dies in Oddity. Why would I <laughs> <laughs> so I, as a father, I said, hey, if you rewrite the words so the astronaut lives, I'll record the song. <laughs> and it, it just kind of went from a father-son project into something, as you say, that hundreds of millions have seen. But to answer Zoe's yeah. question, um, you know, we've been living off the planet for 15 and a half years. As, a, as 15 leading nations of the world, we left Earth 15 and a half years ago. And uh, when you first just start exploring, that, that's, that's a temporary thing, but this is now almost cultural. This is a, a shift of our understanding of ourselves. It becomes a subculture of people living off the planet. And how do you share that? How do you, you know, we're an outpost away from the world, and how do you recognize that that transition is happening within us as a species. And there, you can talk about the graphs and the charts. And we were running 200 experiments on the station and we set records for science utilization and we were busy people. But at the same time, it's a magnificent human experience. And, and I just tried to use every means I could think of to try and share that experience with other people. You'd be quite philosophical about it, in fact. I think mean, you called it a, uh, an extension of the human consciousness of human understanding. You're talking here about the video. Well, I wish all of us, everybody here in the studio, Anst and, and Zoe, if you could join us from Canberra, to if we could all go around the world a hundred times together, just to get on board a ship and actually get next to the window and see our, our, the reality of our planet. Enough times that you get over the, the just the, the jaw drop. Oh, I guess your jaw doesn't drop without gravity. But to get over the, to, but to get over the, the, the gobsmack wonder of it, and then actually start to see uh, the, that we're all in this together, and to actually see the reality of our planet as one place, and not the the uh, hyperactive reporting that we get, uh, the exaggerations that we get every day. I think it's a really important perspective to have, and the more accurately people can see themselves, I think, the more likely we are to make a good decision together. Jocelyn Deby has a question on precisely that subject. Let's go to her. Oh. Sorry, she's up there. I beg your pardon, on the other side. Hi. Yeah, uh, building on that, uh, when you're in space, do you feel more like a Canadian or more like a citizen of Earth? And how long does that feeling last once you've landed? Um, when you first get to space, it's actually kind of comical. You get to the window and you look for things that you know. And in fact, you, you feel this weird compulsion to grab the person next to you and go, hey, look, there's, <laughs> there's Paris. <laughs> I was in Paris, that's Paris. I was in Paris. <laughs> you know, and the other person goes, okay. Uh, as if, but then the second time around, you go, yeah, hey, there's Paris. And then the third time around, and somewhere along the way, you start to realize that your particular uh, parochial view of the world it gets less and less important. And, and yeah, I'm a very proud member of the society that I grew up on. I'm a very proud Canadian. I was happy to command a spaceship with a Canadian flag on my shoulder, but I recognize that it's way more than that. And I had a crew from all around the world. And you, you go around the world 16 times a day, so you see all seven billion people every <laughs> single day. And somewhere along the way, when I was you know, communicating with Twitter, um, 
I, I stopped referring to sort of other people from other places and it all just sort of became a collective sense of us, sort of unconsciously without me thinking about it, which I think is healthy, uh, but it's not normal. And, and the more we can get that way, I think, whether on purpose or just by the things that we do, I think the better we'll be. Just, just coming to the, the second part of Jocene's question, which is how does it feel when you come back again? Now, we know that in the past, astronauts have come back, they've had religious epiphanies in space, and they've come back deeply changed. Some of them have come back and quite disturbed by being back and the change they've, uh, they've found on Earth uh, have become alcoholics. I mean, yeah. how, does that, how do you manage that, the transition back to Earth? <laughs> Yep. Can I have a drink? <laughs> <laughs> Justine, it's a good question. I, uh, at first, you feel awful. I mean, you, just physically. So your, your feelings and emotions that Tony's talking about are, are dominated by the, by the uh, physical changes. That are, so you're nauseous, and you can't balance, and you faint when you stand up. But you get over that in a few weeks. And then and in a few months, you get your musculature back. It takes about a year and a half to get your skeleton back. But the thing that lasts the longest, I think, is the psychological and the philosophical. And the people that you're speaking of that came back with an epiphany or a necessity to, uh, to try and deal with it through you know, drugs or, or you know, alcohol or whatever, that, that was really early on in the space program. When we, the getting to the moon was everything and psychological preparation, understanding what this was gonna to mean to the people was, was tertiary at best. And we did a terrible job of, I mean, Neil Armstrong was an astronaut for eight years total. He flew in space three times. He walked on the moon, he rescued a Gemini that was spinning out of control. And then eight years, and how does he fit that into the rest of his life? Mm. I don't know of any of the astronauts in the latter day who, who were shuttle astronauts who have had an epiphany. We, I think we're much more careful psychologically in letting people know what it's going to be like. Get them trying ready for it. And so that not only do they deal with it better afterwards, but I think they get more out of the experience. And they're maybe hopefully better at letting other people see into it just because it's not such an aberration out of, out of their normal life. Judge, probably too late to use an astronaut. From Dina Zhang. Go ahead, Dina. Hi, my question is to Chris as well. Um, you talk about uh, to drive a spacecraft, you have to fundamentally change yourself. And I think it's a really attractive proposition in a way because there's so many aspects or so many of us that want to change aspects of ourselves. So I'm just wondering, how do you fundamentally change yourself? And also wondering whether the perspective that you've gained from being outside of Earth has helped you with that. Thanks, Dina. To go to the core of your question, uh, one of the most, well, the most dangerous thing you're asked to do as an astronaut is, is to fly the rocket ship. It, on my last flight, I was in space for five months, but 50% of the risk, half of all of the risk that I was going to face in five months off the planet was in the first nine minutes. Mm. It's, it's, launch is risky. And on my first space flight back 20 years ago, the odds of death were one in 38 which if Air Canada, which is the national airline, they, they would crash nine airplanes a day if, if, they, if they flew at that rate. So, so how do you uh, face up to danger in your life? And uh, a lot of us, everybody in this room, has just denied themselves something in life uh, because we're afraid of it. We just basically say, I, I won't do that because I'm afraid. I won't bungee jump, I won't get married, I won't fly an airplane, I won't, whatever. I, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful and therefore I'm just not gonna do that thing. Um, but of course, all of those experiences have a richness that maybe make them worth doing. So how do you change yourself from, from just hiding behind an amorphous fear to, to digging into it, to figuring out that this is something worth taking a risk for? We're all gonna die eventually anyway. So what things in your life did you de decide were worth taking a risk? And to me, I think, uh, early on, giving yourself a definition of what success might look like. If, if, your life, if these things that I'm doing go perfectly, How's it gonna end up? What am I gonna be doing? What am I really trying to accomplish with my life? Because that then lets you choose uh, what you're gonna do next. What, how, and this, I want to walk on the moon. I decided when I was nine, Neil and Buzz are the coolest human beings ever. I wanna walk on the moon. I'm nine years old. What do I do next? And, and so I started reading about it and learning to scuba dive and, and join the air cadets and learn to fly and, and go to university. All of those things we're trying to gather each of the skills that someday may let me do something that was my end life dream. And the, the question we all face is not what 
you know, what do I want to be doing in 30 years? It's the real hard question is what should I do next? Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's the real key of how you change yourself is give yourself a long-term definition of how you want this to turn out so that it helps you choose the small things you need to deliberately whittle away and change about yourself um, so that you can separate danger from fear. You can say, this is a risk worth taking. This is a risk not worth taking. This is something that's important to me. And it's amazing uh, if you go through that mental process internally where each of those little next steps can take you. Now, I'm sure my uh, fellow panelists or our fellow panelists here won't mind if I ask you one more question uh, about this because everyone wants to know, you did something. You talk about the danger of taking off of, uh, in, the, uh, in the spaceship in the first place. Uh, but the other incredibly dangerous thing is something only 200 people roughly have done, which is to walk in space. And mm. you describe that as the experience that trumps everything. It is. Um, an overwhelmingly visual experience. And I'd just like you to somehow pass on to the audience here what that's actually like. Uh, we don't go outside, like, like in the movies, we, uh, Gravity, we don't go outside recreationally. And, uh, <laughs> what was George Clooney doing out there? <laughs> lying around. It's like, like he and, and Sandra met while they were out on a space <laughs> uh, we, it is It's dangerous to go outside, but sometimes you need human dexterity. It's things that someone, it takes human creativity to go out and fix something or build something. So once in a while we accept the risk that we need to go outside. Uh, I was lucky enough to do two spacewalks and to, uh, to take all the training, do all that thing, all the little next steps that get you to the point where now you can safely do that. The moment comes, you turn the hatch, you clunk it up out of place, and you pull yourself out into the universe. And, and suddenly, you're not on Mother Earth looking up. Uh, you know, sort of like, a, like sitting in your mother's lap looking at something. You are in the universe with the world. It's an entirely different perspective. And we, we, we were coming across the Indian Ocean in the darkness, and I, I had all the lights shut off in my suits because I wanted my night vision to adapt, because I wanted to see Perth, and I wanted to pick up Adelaide and, and Melbourne and Sydney. I wanted to see you know, the cities on the coast. But as soon as my eyes got adjusted, uh, we drove into the southern lights. And, they, and we're going five miles a second. And the southern lights were, were rippling and pouring between my legs in all of the colors and three dimensions. And I, it was uh, overwhelmingly beautiful. Just a, an amazing human experience. And this is a natural thing. This is just part of being a planet. This is just the energy from the sun and the upper atmosphere and the fluorescence. But it is, it is just so unconsciously gorgeous. And, and you don't get that level of understanding without challenging yourself, without deciding that some risks are worth taking. And the most uh, memorable, I guess, the most rewarding moment of my entire mm -hmm. life was to have a chance to be one of the first human beings to go out into the universe and get a sense for what it's going to be like when we turn tail to Earth and leave as soon as we solve those problems. Chris, thanks for giving us here mm -hmm. a bit of a sense of that. <laughs> We'll come back and speak a little more about this uh, afterwards. Uh, before we go, our next question.